Thank you all for coming to this uh, conversation about pre-code Hollywood rules are made to be broken. Um, we're just going to introduce ourselves first. My name is Pamela Hutchinson. I'm a freelance writer, critic and curator. And uh, I am one of the co-curators of this season, which we've put together with assistance from Warner Brothers and Park Circus and will be available to tour. Uh, I'm Christina Newland. I am the lead film critic at the I newspaper and a freelancer at Criterion and lots of other places. Uh, and of course, co-curated the season with Pamela. Um, and today we're going to kind of be walking through why we selected these particular films of the many, many pre-code films that there are. Um, what they have to tell us about this, this specific period of Hollywood history and maybe American history. Uh, and kind of walk you through a little chronology of um, how these things came together in Hollywood censorship and um, what the consequences were of that. So I kind of see this as our like our version of an FDR 1930s fireside chat, except for uh, um, more gum smacking dames, more sex, and a few killjoy Catholic censors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically it. So um, we put this all together as everything is done now via Zoom. So now we're having the kind of nice edited highlights of our conversation over the past year about pre-code cinema. So why we're excited about pre-code film? Well, personally, my sort of specialist area is silent cinema and everything else that sparks out around that. So very literally... I went to the Lumiere Festival in Lyon one year, uh, looking to go to you know, the birthplace of the movies, the factory gates, and the hottest ticket in town that year were these remasters of the pre-code films. And it was something that very much appealed to me because, again, this follows on from silent cinema. You know, everything silent is essentially pre-code. And I'm really interested in those periods of film history where people are experimenting, lots of rule breaking, lots of rule creating. And I think looking at these pre-code films is a really interesting example of showing how people are creating boundaries and testing boundaries and creating them again. So it's basically right up my street. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for me, I think coming at it from a slightly different point of view, but I, I really like this idea that, that you're saying of the, the first few decades of motion pictures in some ways, in the 1930s. I, mean, I suppose the silent era is is modernity. The 1930s is you know the beginning of the talkies, and we're looking at we're starting to really explore the medium. Um, so, for me, the films are really great on a thematic level as well because it's like this Venn diagram of my interest as a writer and curator. Um, partly because I'm very interested in the subject of female desire at the movies and in the movies. Um, I edited an anthology in 2020 to that end, um, collecting a bunch of culture writers about that topic. Um, and I mean, this is one of the great moments in Hollywood history where we get to see that writ large because we get to see characters that will become forbidden later, like sex workers as central characters, like women who actually just enjoy sex and are unapologetic about it on screen and don't get punished for it at the end or die, some sort of sacrificial noble death as they often do later on in Hollywood, um, or Mae West telling Cary Grant to come up and see her sometime, that kind of sexual voraciousness of those films. So that's appealing to me immediately. Um, and my, my other big interest is crime cinema. Uh, and of course, this period is the, the great genesis for, of course, the gangster movies and, and so many of these tough girl and tough guy characters. Um, so for me, like a film like Blonde Crazy or like Jewel Robbery, which is showing tomorrow, um, a woman is party to a crime and she really likes it. She loves the thrill of being bad um, without judgment or punishment. And I, I think that's really amazing. Um, I think, like, like many people here, if you come to a festival or archive cinema like Cinema Rediscovered, we all enjoy the pleasures of Golden Age cinema, the stars and the glamour and, the, and things. Pre-code films offer you just a little bit more. They offer you something that you sort of can't believe belongs to the Golden Age. So they're quite, um, we've said this before, they're quite addictive films. Mm -hmm. uh, they're often quite short. You can binge on pre-code films and you'll come out a very different person at the end. And I highly recommend that you do that. Um, should we talk about why we chose these particular films? Because it, it wasn't easy, was it? No, not no, at no. all. Not at all. And some of the films, I think it's worth kind of diving in, the, <laughs> going in at the deep end and saying that some of the films... Um, I think pre-code has a reputation in general for being progressive, and sometimes that's true. But there are also things dealt with, like, for example, sexual harassment, which we see in Babyface, where it is sort of treated as a fact of women's lives that they just sort of have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so I think we had to be thoughtful about what we chose in terms of, you know, framing things as, um, you know, 
perhaps not perfectly progressive all of the time. <laughs> yeah, there's lots that we sort of admire in these films, but there was at least one film that we didn't choose because while it's got many things to recommend it, overall it's not one that you would necessarily want to be spreading around the country saying this isn't a great example of pre-code cinema mm -hmm. as we have other examples. I mean, <laughs> obviously we did have Yellow Face in uh, A Free Soul, but we yeah. had many other interesting things as well. So one of the ways we looked at it was stars, wasn't it? So we've got some big stars. So do you want to talk about James Cagney? Sure, yeah. Um, so Cagney is, and I mean, there are a lot of stars like this. Um, I, I spoke a bit about Gable as well in A Free Soul. Cagney is one of those stars that comes out almost fully formed, it feels like, from his first few films at Warner Brothers. He is this pugnacious, you know, has this sort of tenement walk where he bounces, where he walks. He's got this low center of gravity, like a prize fighter. Um, he, he's just got this wonderful physicality and this wonderful vivacity while he's on screen. You can't take your eyes off of him. Um, and he really helped usher in, uh, I think, I think him and, and later on people like maybe John Garfield, mm -hmm. a certain kind of um, very like rough, hewn masculinity versus um, maybe the more 1920s suave mm -hmm. actors. Um, Clark Gable, on the other hand, is interesting because we, of course, mainly associate him with Gone with the Wind, with a, him being, you know, what they call the king of Hollywood. But in a lot of those early roles, he was really awful. Like, I think in, in one film that I, I can't recall the name of off the top of my head, it's not in our program, but a pre-code film that he holds some kids hostage. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, you know, and he's truly awful in a free soul. He, he, you know, at first you're not so sure. You know, he's bad. You don't think he's that bad. He essentially um, blackmails mm. um, Norma Shearer and, and, uh, into, into a marriage, into a forced marriage, or, or presumably that's what's going to happen. So... There were a few other stars we really wanted to include and like so um, Norma Shearer is a great example of someone who isn't perhaps talked about that much at the moment. Um, I, a lot of people remember that she was married to Irvin Thalberg and that she had some of these sort of great roles in period films but she very much was a woman of the pre-code era. We've got these scrolling images and yeah this is quite a typical conversation with Norma Shearer where she would be talking about sex quite openly and that was sort of part of her persona. It wasn't, it wasn't just that you know she was married to a respectable studio executive so it was all fine she really did sort of push that um and so we think maybe you know we thought it was great to show a role in which she gets to be fully Norma Shearer and not perhaps a slightly quieter version that you see later after the code um also I really really wanted to show Barbara Stanwyck because I feel like the pre-code era is like the, the steel backbone of Barbara Stanwyck. She, you know, early on in, in the 30s, she was playing in melodramas for Capra. She was playing in these pre-code films. We're showing Babyface, which is possibly the toughest pre-code of them all. Uh, and you'll, you'll know if you know anything about Barbara Stanwyck that she had this uh, pre-code life beforehand. You know, she, she did experience her foster homes and lots of, uh, lots of uh, rough neighbourhoods, or is it crowded, crowded places and jammed up emotions, she said it was. Um, when you see the roles that she is in after the production code comes into force, you'll see the remnants of the pre-code Barbara Stanwyck always, you know, and especially if you're going to see Double Indemnity, Philip Dietrichson is a woman with a full-on pre-code past. So that was, they were, they were four of the people we really wanted to include, but we've also got Joan Blondell because Joan Blondell, yes. how can you resist? <laughs> yes, and I mean, even like a film like Footlight Parade, she plays opposite Cagney, you always feel that they're they're matched really, really well. And she does have a certain effervescence, I think, which, yes, she's tough, but there is something always playful in her that feels, um, it feels like she's been taken right off the street, like she's a, she's a street character. Yeah, she, you know. You feel like you might meet um, Joan Blondell in real life and find her quite charming. Um, <laughs> Jean Harlow is quite a different proposition. Uh, there's sort of no one quite like her for sheen and gloss and sort of impudence. And a lot of the films uh, you see Jean Harlow in, she's playing, you know, this this cliche that I hate of the dumb blonde, you know. In pre-code films, she gets to explore, well, we're showing Red-Headed Woman, which is basically her first real acting role. Um, she gets to explore a much rougher kind of character and the sort of implicit class narrative that's always around Jean Harlow in all of her films really comes to the fore, I think. And then, of course, we had to have some humour. So we had William and Kay, didn't we? Yes, <laughs> yes. And William is, you know, he, he is wonderful in every line delivery and jewel robbery. But I actually really rate 
Kay Francis because she she does have slightly similar thing to Norma Shearer, which is that she has a sort of almost aristocratic air, which, as you wrote in your great Guardian piece, <laughs> that, you know, it, it's almost as though she's above, like she's able to get away with things because she has such an aristocratic air. She's like turning her nose up at the social mores of, of the time. Um, and so she is this very bored, I believe, countess yeah. Um, <laughs> in this film and her, her, you know, falling head over heels for William Powell, the jewel thief, mm -hmm. and then essentially completely giving up her, her own very dull existence in order to become his partner in crime mm -hmm. um, and everything that that entails. It feels so utterly, um, you know, she doesn't feel like, it feels like there's quite a big divide in terms of femininity with these films. You have the Kay Francis and the Norma Shearer characters who, who are um, a bit otherworldly and, and, and feel quite, I don't know, high class. Yeah. And then you have the Barbara Stanwyck's and the, the sort of tough-talking dames. Yeah. Um, and class is just such a huge thing in these films, even um, implicitly, even in, in the sort of, like, throwaway lines. Yeah. But certainly I'm thinking again about a free soul, having just, you know, mm -hmm. been thinking about it for the introduction today. And there's a great scene between Lionel Barrymore, who plays Norma Shearer's dad in that film, uh, who's the defense attorney, and Clark Gable, when he discovers the affair. And I can't remember the exact... Um, the phrasing, but mongrel. they speak to each other in a bar, and he he really like you know you basically calls him like a mongrel, like he's yeah. not good enough, and so it's interesting to see class play out that explicitly in um, in American cinema of this time. Yeah, I think often the class system, the way it's used in these films, it allows us to sort of allows the films to sort of talk about morality and then clamp back down on it again to sort of push the boundaries and show people we don't perhaps sympathise with enforcing those rules. Also, Kay Francis in Jewel Robbery tomorrow, um, she introduces a trope you've seen twice already today, which is the pre-code bathroom scene, which is just a shameless excuse for nudity <laughs> or the suggestion of nudity, which either in fact or in silhouette was expressly forbidden, obviously, uh, in, uh, in, in the code. Um, I think we should probably, we keep talking about the code, maybe we should go and do a little bit of Explain history. Bit, yeah. It's not going to be much of a history lesson. I know a lot of you will know a lot about this history, but when you talk about pre-code films, it feels like you're often going back and forth in time. So it sort of all starts in 1915, and don't worry, it's not going to take this long. Uh, in 19, <laughs> 1915, you know, films were being censored state by state in America, and uh, the Mutual Film Corporation took uh, the Ohio, I can't say these foreign <laughs> place names, Ohio state <laughs> government to, to, uh, to court and saying, you know, we should have free speech for our films. The Supreme Court ruled in 1915 that movies were a product, they were a commercial product, free speech doesn't apply. Uh, and so you'll see the most notorious film from 1915 opens with a card that says, you know, plea for the art of the motion picture, as often people who uh, make arguments about free speech often use them for hate speech in that case. But we have this precedent that says, you know, you can control what's said in films and if they don't have that First Amendment protection. Seven years later, you'll love that, won't you? Because you're not going to go year by year. And 1922 is the big year of Hollywood scandal, the Roscoe Arbuckle trial, where he was falsely but very publicly accused of murder, as you were talking about earlier, and, um, and was William Desmond Taylor's murder and all kinds of things. William Hayes, the former postmaster general, was brought in to clean up Tinseltown, which sounds like the beginning of a plot, of course, of a film. Um, he tried. He tried. He came up with what he thought of, he called the formula of what should and shouldn't be allowed on screen. Meanwhile, let's be honest, lots of women with William Hayes' support and backing were doing a lot of the heavy lifting of cleaning up Hollywood. They were setting up things like the uh, central dormitories for young women who come to Hollywood and central casting, all these things to get past the kind of actual sleaze that was going on in Hollywood at the time. And sadly, as we know, hasn't entirely been wiped out anything but... By 1927, a sort of Catholic priest and a movie trade paper editor come up with the sort of famous list of don'ts and be carefuls. And this is partly, you know, working with the studios. The studios want to avoid being censored state by state. They want to take control of this. They don't want to put out films and then risk them not playing. So it looks for a while like the studios are going to play ball and start making their films much more respectable to the court of middle class opinion. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Uh, so by 1929, the Hayes office was created, um, but in the terms that it existed, it was not really tenable. Um, it was actually censoring studio output. Studios would submit scripts to them as a matter of course, but it wasn't taken very seriously by the film industry in general. In 1931, the Hollywood Reporter literally referred to the Hayes office as a joke. 
Um, but numerous religious groups, uh, particularly the Catholic Legion of Decency, uh, began to complain about Hollywood output, especially in the early 1930s, 3031, when you talk about the rise of the rip from the headlines films, when you have Al Capone and Bonnie and Clyde and these all these real life gangsters that are marauding on the streets or at large. Uh, so there were a lot of fears around criminality and around the ability of motion pictures to influence social behavior. Uh, particularly at the start of the Great Depression. You know, we talk about 1929, of course, the Wall Street crash. So in the years of the Depression and economic strain, there was a certain looking inward and a certain fear about what people would be, you know, willing to do under dire circumstances and how that would affect juvenile delinquency and street crime uh, and so on. Uh, so there were calls for a congressional investigation into Hollywood, and it did begin to make the industry, you know, over the years a little bit more nervous. Um... So there were a few factors that were involved in uh, this period eventually coming to an end and the production code administration being fully instated. Uh, a, a Catholic layperson uh, and press officer called Joseph Breen was instated as the head of the Motion Picture Association of America in 1932, uh, and he was far more virulent in his views than William Hayes, who could be called something of a compromiser. Um, and he was a noted anti-Semite to boot. And it's worth noting that a lot of the issues with the religious organizations and perhaps with middle America as well were centered around the fact that many of the Hollywood moguls and many people in Hollywood were in fact Jewish. Uh, and that did have some part to play in a certain suspicion of the, um, the morality of Hollywood. Um, so as Pamela was saying as well, the idea that on a state-to-state -state level that various censorship boards who had all different standards of qualities could be affecting Hollywood film and that actually Hollywood studios were beginning to lose money because their films were being damaged by jagged cuts from regional cinemas and regional censors. Um, they began to see that there was also a f financial impetus for them to come together and uh, self-censor rather than let Congress or a federal institution or a bunch of different state boards do that. Um, so as ever, the bottom line was really what mattered with studio heads. And they realized that there was also a market for family-friendly pictures and that those were starting to make money too. Um, so by 1934, the summer of 1934, uh, after the Catholic Legion of Decency threatened to boycott any film that didn't have the Hays Code sort of enforced by the um, production code, uh, that was sort of the point at which censorship properly kind of came in and had, had teeth, was able to make studios submit um, their materials even before a production and also during a production, which effectively meant that they weren't just censoring films, but they had the ability to completely shape what American film output looked like from 1934 onward. Uh, I would add that it's, a, it's an apocryphal story, but in spite of the fact that the studios more or less all fell into line, um, there is a story that audiences in New York and Los Angeles when in 34, when the production code seal of approval first started to appear on titles, would boo and hiss at the screen. <laughs> so it wasn't universally popular by any stretch of the imagination, if that's to be believed. Yeah. And so the, the films that we're thinking of as pre-code and the films that we're talking about are ones from that period where there was a code and it wasn't being enforced. So we're talking about, well, rule-breaking films, effectively, and we're talking about a certain knowingness that the industry is in a bit of a crisis, obviously, because it's the Depression. Uh, they want to sell tickets and they want to appeal to people and they want to make films that seem relevant at a time that seems like quite a desperate time. You know, it's hard to characterise periods of history like that, but, you know, there are gangster films in this period, as Christina said. There are also horror films that are pre-code films, very much so all those James whale films and there are also lots of social comment films like you know fugitive from a chain gang and so on and you'll actually see strains of social critique in almost all of these films i mean maybe not jewel robbery but maybe i'm not looking hard enough well, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> maybe not jewel robbery <laughs> we'll test that one out over a martini tomorrow and it all makes sense and um, so we wanted to look at some of the examples in the film's you know, not exhaustively, uh, where these films that you've been watching and enjoying are actively flouting the Hayes Code. Because it's worth noting that lots of these films bear the bruises or the like, open wounds of the censor still. So lots of films uh, were involved in like 
exchanges of letters back and forth with the office. Um, you were talking about the, the, the proposed cut to your free soul, mm-hmm. um, where she sort of beckons Clark Gable onto the sofa with her, which, you know, it's understandable. Um, but some things were actually cut. So, you know, if Red-Headed Woman was cut, uh, wasn't released in this country, Babyface was cut quite desperately, and we've only recently discovered the pre-release cut, which is intact, fully shocking. But there are many, many, many things that got through, because I think, I don't know if Americans have the phrase about being hung for a sheep as a lamb. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you try and fill your script with so many audacious things and they argue with two or three of them, you can still get quite a lot past. Exactly. I suppose if you're excessive. Yeah. I've even heard filmmakers say that way, you know, mm. beyond the, this period of, of like, you know, actually being a little bit over the top because then perhaps, you know, the stuff that gets shaved isn't really that important to the, to the story itself or to what you want to keep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to my mind, it's it's almost easier to understand the ways these films broke rules by kind of looking at the post, mm-hmm. you know, the kind of more um, staple golden age Hollywood, what those things don't have, <laughs> in a sense. Um, what the Casablancas and It's a Wonderful Life, yes. you know, would, would definitely not have in them, like open drug use, like openly smoking weed, which is all over jewel robbery. Um, or the inference that people that people had slept together out of wedlock the night before, which you kind of get in old Hollywood, but it's always very kind of oblique. It's not really, all, you know, it's 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 inferred. It's not stated. It's a lot of divorcee divorcee couples in golden age Hollywood just to have that sexual chemistry. So the plots often get quite complicated to suggest that people might have that sort of knowledge of each other in that way. (laughs) So we're thinking of the awful truth, basically. Uh, (laughs) Which we have no complaints about. But, you know, say, like, um, and, like, the famous stories of censors later on, Mm -hmm. like, the outlaw with, like, the stitching up of, like, a low-cut dress and the whole thing with the the Jane Russell bra. Mm -hmm. Or um, even, like, Hitchcock very cleverly breaking up the kisses with dialogue in that famous kiss scene in Notorious between Ingrid Bergman and Cary Grant instead of making one long passion to embrace because that was banned by the code. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it was always interesting to see the ways that filmmakers found around this stuff, but it also shows you exactly what pre-code films were able to do that later films were not able to do, at least explicitly. Yeah, if you've got a favourite novel that was adapted in the golden age, you know, likely that they changed the plot. I'm thinking of Rebecca. There are things that Daphne du Maurier can do that Alfred Hitchcock can't, and that's quite shocking in its own way. Um, I was thinking about, there's a there's a really fun pre-code film, unfortunately it's not in our season, called Waterloo Bridge, which is about a streetwalker who falls in love with a soldier. And that's from 1931, and when they remake it, in 1940 with Vivian Lee, you would not believe how long this character is a ballerina before she's very, very briefly an off screen, a street walker, just for a second, just for enough to make the, the plot make sense. And of course she deeply regrets it and she carries on talking like this throughout the entire film, uh, which is, is, I mean, they're both fantastic films, but you just get a different thing. You get something that is melodrama in the old fashioned sense of being an action thriller with lots of lots of shocking scenes and then you get melodrama in the sense of the women's weepy almost so you you change the whole tone of Hollywood so these films are very much the old-fashioned kind of melodrama right I mean we just noticed in a free soul we had the hint of nudity we had gunfire Mm. um we had this uh respect for the authority figures in the court I should say (laughs) I don't think it was a great depiction of the American legal system (laughs) Well, it wasn't a respectful depiction of the Hollywood legal system. Certainly sympathy for criminals. Sympathy Up to a point. Sympathy for criminals is a really big thing. And now I think, you know, think of almost any crime film that you like. We think about anti-heroes and we understand that audiences might find, you know, Bonnie and Clyde quite attractive, but also know that it's not good to rob banks or kill people. And, you know, and it doesn't, it sound, when I say it like that, it sounds insulting to the audience that you wouldn't believe they could do that. Mm-hmm. But the whole premise of the code is that people will be... Uh, too impressionable to make sense of this and that's one of the reasons why we're slightly bristling at the, we're slightly anti-code I should say yeah well <laughs> sure I mean it's, it's deeply catholic but but also it's deep it's deeply racist and deeply sexist and we'll I think we'll get into that a little bit more yeah um so we've got a lot of sympathy for criminals in almost all of our films we've got uh free soul to robbery and lon crazy um There's a lot of drunkenness in the films. And obviously we're coming off the Prohibition era. We're still in there. And we're quite interested in that. I have seen some pre-code films that treat drunkenness with a lot of levity. But actually, in most of these films, it's a very serious matter. Lionel Barrymore is obviously completely incapacitated by alcoholism Mm -hmm. in A Free Soul. And in Red-Headed Woman, Jean Harlow... well, terrible things happen when you drink bathtub gin and, and, and she is warned about it and it's a really harrowing scene, you know. And so it's almost like uh, 
morality is about depiction or about the presence rather than the actual depiction. So sure. this is what we say, we sort of like these films, not just because it's a, a race to include lots of titillating action, it's also because it's a little bit more intelligent about how these things go on. Um, you're not meant to make a mockery of the institution of marriage, <laughs> under the, uh, which unfortunately does happen in almost all of these films. Um, and there's a prostitution, as I was mentioning, Waterloo Bridge is sort of quite clearly referred to in some of these films, although we haven't gone too big on that. No, no but I think um, in general these films, they, they are more sympathetic to sex workers than uh, mm. they, will, they will be later on in a few years, uh, unless, again, it's that noble noble sacrificial lamb kind of s story arc. Yeah. Um, no one's really, very rarely are women allowed the latitude to just, just simply sit in their decisions, whether those are bad decisions or not, or what their circumstances, um, yeah. without judgment, I feel. Yeah, I, mean, I think the entire theme of The Free Soul is whether you do sit in your decisions, really, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, there, is a, there is a scene of sexual assault in Red-Headed Woman that we should talk about because it's uh, not a particularly pleasant scene, but it's also in many ways it's quite frank in that it's treated as something that is an act of cruelty and violence rather than being an excuse for the sex scene, which you often see in um, uh, 1920s films that sort of bypass the idea of female consent altogether. So it's not a particularly enjoyable scene to watch, but it's very honest that everybody in the scene, and I say there's three people, because Una Merkel is listening to it happen, know exactly what's happened here, and the audience is allowed to understand that this is something that happened within the relationship between these two people. Um, that's not a way to sell the experience of watching Red-Headed Women to you. I do appreciate that, but there's uh, there's also a lot of uh, need to lose humour But the well. fact that rape and sexual assault became so much of a taboo mm -hmm. uh, for decades of Golden Age Hollywood meant that the 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 frequency of it in life perhaps became downplayed in the, in the public eye. Yeah. Um, the, the, the fact that pre-code films treat it so frankly, but also that it is mm. not uncommon yeah. in many ways, I think it in and of itself feels, looking back, feels a bit surprising in a good way that it's being depicted in general. Yeah, exactly, because you can, uh, in later films, all you see is a torn blouse, and, and you could miss it if you're not used to watching Golden Age mm -hmm. films, and so all of these films don't really make sense um, to us as modern audiences, and one of the reasons that we're interested in showing these films is that we think that this is a particularly, well, it's always a good moment for a pre-code film, but, you know, these are films that stand up to repeated viewings in different eras because they chime with a, a slightly more, I don't know, they seem more up-to-date than the films that followed them for the next decade sometimes or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they do sometimes feel that way. Um, I mean, you have a film like Queen Christina, which is, yes. you know, not in our season, but is showing here and is, um, is pre-code and is, has open same-sex relationships and a bisexual female character. So, like, yeah, I mean, is that something that we might have seen? I think we were talking about yeah. this before. Is something we might have seen more of if, in 1934, the code hadn't come down so far? Yeah. If you look at the way that, obviously, we've all seen the standy in the lobby like Anna Mae Wong and Marlene Dietrich look at each other in Shanghai Express it feels like there's the beginning of something and what we talk about in this period really is talking about coded characters because it's not open um, there's this sort of you know maybe it's romantic the idea that perhaps if the code hadn't started to be enforced so soon there would have been a greater depiction of same-sex desire in Hollywood films and sure. we don't know but it's nice to be optimistic <laughs> a lot of these films make you think that something could happen I mean equally we're talking about Teresa Harris in Babyface who's very much a uh, a part of the narrative. Uh, she's on her poster. Uh, she is Barbara Stanwyck's companion in crime in Babyface. She uh, is very important to Barbara Stanwyck's character. I'd say she's more important to the protagonist than she is to the plot, but uh, it's both Teresa Harris's first credited roles and actually one of her better ones in the 30s, um, not least because she sings the song that you'll be singing all the way out the theatre, but also because... Uh, it's quite clear that there's some understanding between Barbara Sandwich's character and Teresa Harris's character of the sim similarities and differences in their class status, um, which, uh, I mean, Teresa Harris was very open about the fact that she could never get above the role of maid in, in the films, and this is a film that sort of seems to understand that's going to happen to her. And that's kind of where, when the code comes in and you have the uh, explicit rule against mis miscegenation or um, interracial romance. It says sex relationships, but in practice, actually, a lot of the times it was even just friendships. Yeah. 
Um, and so in 1934, when the first version of Imitation of Life comes out, Joseph Breen has a lot of complaints about that. Not just, I mean, there isn't any interracial sex in the film, but it is treated as there's a mixed race character and therefore the implication is that at some point, and that is actually the issue yeah. in 1934. So. Yeah, the implication of passing is that miscegenation. I think, and, and also, you know, Hollywood is built around romances and that's always what it is, before the code, during the code, after the code. Romance and, and sex, as Norma Shearer would say, is very important. So okay. if you are... Um, if you're a leading actor and you want to play the leading role in a film and you know you're not going to be able to be paired up with any of the studio's other main stars, that means it's like a dead stop to your career, which is why Anna Mae Wong left Hollywood, mm -hmm. basically, and uh, why uh, she struggled to get the roles that we all know that she deserved. And that, that's another thing about the code, that fundamentally it changed careers in many ways. I don't know if you want to... Do you want to talk about that at all? Or am yeah, I... we could do, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have people who sort of are forgotten because they... They left. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Ruth Chatterton was a great star in this period. Yes. And never, yeah. Miriam uh, Hopkins as well in Design for a Living. A great film about a woman who film. can't choose between two men, so just dates them both. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, And they're both just, fine with it? Yes. Ish. It's, it's, a, it's a comedy about polyamory and it's completely open. And she said something like, you know, gentlemen, they'll, you know, we have a gentleman's agreement that there'll be no sex in this relationship, but of course I'm not a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> and Miriam Hopkins is brilliant in that and in so many of these, like, Lubitsch comedies and things like that. And she does have roles in later films, just here as like the aunt and the heiress and so on. But the Hollywood that had Miriam Hopkins at the heart of it was a much more fun Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, believe me. Um, and then Anna Mae Wong yeah, and, Anna Mae and many, other, many other actors like Nina mm -hmm. Mae McKinney. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, there are opportunities to be anything other than sidelined and tokenized. Just, I'm not saying was not an issue during pre-code films as well. You know, I think it's important not to make the mistake of thinking whether we're talking about gender relations or race or anything that that yeah. pre-code films were completely islands of progressiveness. But at the same time, the opportunities for certain things just went right out the window. Yeah. And uh, because there was such an obsession with not just race but skin color in terms of people needing to look their race, look enough of their race on a, on the screen, you'd have um, you know much later on. Uh, mixed race actress like Lena Horne being passed over for a role in Showboat for Ava Gardner, a white woman, mm -hmm. uh, when the, the role called for a mixed race woman because she was too light skinned and she wouldn't look essentially black enough. Yeah. So that there is a whole host of problems that continue for actors of color throughout Hollywood history because of the code, yeah. essentially. I mean, Samira Ahmed, on the opening night of this festival, she was talking about Merle Oberon in Wuthering Heights. And Merle Oberon was obviously uh, of mixed heritage and was passing completely as white for reasons of her career. And if anybody knows the plot of Wuthering Heights, the idea that you'd be trying to keep that film as white as possible just doesn't make sense. You know, and, you know it's an adult novel for adults. And uh, it's, a shame that, it's, it's a shame that we had this version of Hollywood history in many ways. I mean... We should perhaps say that, that there are many people who think there are positive consequences to the code, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking from the moral dimension at all, because uh, I think we've made our feelings quite clear about the, the impetus behind these rules. But, you know, a lot of people would say that the um, innuendo and the crisp dialogue that you get in something like the uh, horse racing dialogue scene in The Big Sleep or almost Dialogue is foreplay. Dialogue is foreplay. I mean, explicitly so, you might say. I mean, too much so. And double indemnity that you wouldn't have these ways of sublimating and uh, speaking in tongues to particular parts of the audience, you know, and people do enjoy that idea that there's something to be found buried in the films. I wonder whether we lost more than we gained, though. Yeah, I mean, I think the jury's still... I, I couldn't say one way or the other. I think it's sort of one of those coulda, woulda, shoulda <laughs> things. But I do think that the, there is a subliminal or underground quality sometimes to certain things in Golden Age Hollywood that are appealing, certainly. that The idea that, you know, the most talented artists and performers, rather than having to state things explicitly, did have to use the tricks of performance or lighting or framing to suggest something or to say the unsayable. Um, whether that's sexually or otherwise. And yeah, I mean, certainly that's created some wonderfully atmospheric moments. So I can see why people make that argument. And Hitchcock, for example, in that such a famous kiss scene between yeah. Bergman and Grant, something like that. I can see why the argument's made, but I guess it's probably a little more, <laughs> a little more complicated than that. And if you think about um, Hitchcock as well, one of the things is that when the production came, code came in, it was like pass 
or fail. It wasn't age ratings. So don't, they don't come in until much later. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, I should say that the rule about free speech in movies was overturned in 1952, thanks to Anna Magnani and Roberta Rossellini um, and, <laughs> and Lamour. But um, so it's just like it almost stops making these horror films and these really scary violent films so you get this idea that Hollywood is now only for children or only for family audiences and it doesn't get to sort of explore those darker themes until much later on. You know, one of the things that I think, you know, people people like Christina and I who perhaps like classic cinema a lot uh, often joke about it. So if you tell people that Scarface was a remake they won't believe you because that 80s film was so violent you can't believe that they made one back in the 1930s but that's exactly what Precode is all about it's about the kind of violence that shocks you in any sort of generation or the sort of sexual audaciousness that shocks you in any generation um we have covered quite a lot of things but we were going to talk a little bit about women and the roles of women in films uh, we were talking about the idea of films that promote marriage but don't promote or don't depict either sex, you can't share a bed with your husband, or um, having a baby. And where does that put a woman dramatically if marriage is the goal? Well, yeah, exactly. There's no, there's no sort of in-between space for them to... I mean, when you're talking about issues of sex and marriage in terms of how they're being depicted on the screen, if you won't show extramarital affairs, maybe slightly less so, but... but certainly pregnancy on screen, which is part of the code, rape, um, I mean, you, you, again, you get the implication of it later on, but not in the same way. Um, the whole fallen woman trope presented in a less, uh, you know, in a more straightforward way, I would say, and sort of um, freewheeling singledom on mm-hmm. its own. Uh, you, you know, you get less of the female experience or you get less of the on- honesty about women's lives in general, just through its sheer existence, the our ability, our ability to misbehave or step outside of the set lines, yeah. and that includes the impetus to marry, mm-hmm. uh, is very um, circumscribed. Yeah, and we're still sort of seeing that hangover in Hollywood. And like, uh, you know, I mean, there have been quite a few films recently that have been very praised for showing sort of independent single women and perhaps the messiness of their lives. That's mm-hmm. quite a sort of popular trope at the moment, but it's it's always presented as something new because Hollywood really doesn't like to get those R-rated films, particularly for matters like that. And obviously at the moment with women's rights being under threat in America, it feels particularly uh, pertinent to look at why we have certain depictions of female characters and why we don't have others. You know, I love a tart with a heart character. You know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. You know, a heartwarming story about maternal love, but you know, there are other sides to the female experience, perhaps, uh, that we could look at. And um, we talked a little bit about um, racial representation too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm thinking about films like The Bitter Tea of General Yen that appear to sort of be making some plea for tolerance and this idea that they're almost making an argument for to abandon these outdated ideas about interracial uh, what would be called interracial love at the time and yet they've got actors in yellow face and it's really not there so you know that what's happening in the pre-code era isn't perfect by any means but it feels like it's a step onwards to a journey than destination just never arrived I mean, yeah of yeah. course they all seem antiquated by today's standards that mm-hmm. almost goes without saying um but yes i think the opportunity was there at least. There was a seed of something. Maybe that's why you feel like what we were saying about, you know, about same-sex relationships as well, that after 1934, you, there's always that hope, perhaps, that rather than going on to make really middle-brow, middle-brow literary adaptations, yeah. which God knows MGM liked to do in the mid to late 1930s, <laughs> and um, Norma Shearer ended up in things like the Barretts of Wimpole Street and all these kind of really staid historical, you know, historical biopics and things like that. But... You like to imagine that there was some alternate, alternate um, future that was more progressive, maybe. <laughs> and it's interesting when we talk about period drama as well, because that's one thing that's really strangely, um, what, what's wrong with the costume drama? There's actually nothing wrong with it. But the films in the pre-code era were set often in contemporary world and very much spoke to the audiences directly about sure. experiences they were having. Therefore, after the code, you get a lot of films that are set in historical periods as if to say, don't worry, nothing, this has got nothing to do with real life, you know, even if it is a story of a murder or so on. And that it begins to make this association between period drama or historical drama and something that's sort of safe and censored and babyish. Fluff. 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 I mean, not all of it is fluff, but broadly speaking. (laughs) That's fluff. That that period. Um, (laughs) We you know, have, I think yeah. I think those films they say things like you know especially what we're saying about criminality and how a lot of the films that we've chosen mm. um, you know deal in crime. Mm. 
it's better to be making a living on the end of a gun than it is to be helpless and starving on a bread line. Yeah. It, it's a very tough, real-world mentality. Yeah. Um, and even if the people in the audience aren't necessarily going home with that in their back pocket, like, okay, I'm going to start a life of crime, there is something that's, you know, it serves as a, as a it's quite cathartic, I think, yeah. for, for, for the audience at that period. When we think about the sort of postcode era, a lot of people postcode, of course, suddenly it makes sound, sounds like something else. Um, you think of like the idea of the musical as escapism, but the pre-code musicals even are very political and very yeah. much about the contemporary world. Gold Diggers of 1933 is about people who are starveling desperate, but also has songs about having sex in the local park, about the way that veterans are treated and about, you know, financial worries about the, about the depression. And it's interesting that you then have this idea that envelops golden age Hollywood as it's a distraction from real life and that is something that sort of is used to some of be criticise these films which you know I could watch singing on the rain in the rain on a loop so I, I'm probably the people that they're talking about but actually it's very possible to use almost any genre of film the pre-code era tortoise and talk directly to your audience about the things that really worry them and the things that um they need to make sense of, you know, because this is how we make, you know, this is why we go to the cinema often, to sort of see stories that maybe challenge us and make us understand what's going on in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, rel I mean, as ever, is, is relevant because I still feel like on occasion we're having conversations that are about the sensitivity of the audience to, or the, 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 the malleability of an audience. <laughs> Um, of seeing certain representations or, again, to go back to the crime, I get, you know, like a broken record, but <laughs> like a crime film, um, you know, the idea of, of like um, the amorality of modern gangster films yeah. or something or, the, you know, the fact that people have an issue with the fact that films don't always neatly tie their, their morality up in a, in a bow. They might not explicitly be saying that, but sometimes it feels like that's the upshot. And so whilst that's very far from having an organized censorship board, mm -hmm. um, it, it is interesting that these ideas do rec they recur because I think ultimately what it means is cinema is very powerful and we are interested in the effects it has on our psyche mm. and the, the effects it has on the collective consciousness mm. and how people behave as a result of it. Yeah, I like your idea of you being a broken criminal record. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good. No, I mean, you know, I think we also all have sensitivities and I think that's something that we don't want to sort of ignore. There are things that we will watch in films or read in books and think, you know, that's quite upsetting or difficult for us to process. And good... Uh, I wouldn't say censorship, but classification should take into account changing ideas, uh, whether that might be progressive ideas or sure. the fact that there are certain there are certain things in these films that we find incredibly shocking along racial lines that wouldn't necessarily shock the audiences as much in 1933. So good classification and good understanding of, you know, which films might be suitable for which audiences does move with the times. And so the problem in many ways with the production code is that it was too blunt a tool and it had just one set of values behind it, one sure. that didn't reflect uh, a changing world. So it didn't really go away until the late 60s, you know. Um, so that's a long time mm -hmm. to, be, um, to be living uh, Joseph Breen's rules. Yeah, in the 1950s, there were, you know, it was like consistent chipping away. Mm -hmm. Otto Preminger's The Moon is Blue, famously. Um, and then I think at some point, I can't remember the year, sometime in the, in the mid, I think early to mid 1950s, there was the finally including movies under the First Amendment. Yes, that's 1952. Um, 1952. Yeah. So that's reversing the 1915 thing. Yeah. And yeah. That, I mean, that's a long time. And life, <laughs> life had obviously changed a lot in that space of time. So I think it began to just seem very antiquated to people mm -hmm. even then. I mean, and also it's a it's a business decision because people are going to go and watch the foreign movies that aren't into these rules, you know, and uh, Hollywood has a way of buying away the threat of uh, outsiders, whether it's um, foreign talent, if, you know, foreign cinema's doing very well, they just buy that talent up, or if it's the television, they, they have ways of fighting back against that. So Hollywood is always working out how to make money, uh, whether that's from uh, pandering to the moral majority or perhaps from shocking people, which is, mm -hmm. you know... The studios who are making these films were openly thinking, you know, there is an audience for something a little bit audacious. Sure. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of these films were hits. A Free Soul mm. was a really big hit at the mm. time. So, you know, obviously there was an audience. And <laughs> Yeah, I know. And obviously, if Norma Shearer was the queen of Hollywood, that's that's what Hollywood is all about. Um, I don't know if anyone's been reading these slides. It's just sort of lots of um, publicity material. But if you are watching A Free Soul, it says here that the negligee she was wearing in a key scene is tangerine velvet. So uh, that that's my favourite fact for the day. <laughs> 
Um, so one of the things we wanted to talk about um, was why would you watch a pre-code film in 2022? Because obviously we can go to cinema these days and watch films about, you know, watch the worst person in the world. For example, we can watch very violent crime films. What is the value of looking back at these films and uh, getting them into your cinemas uh, now? I think it's, I mean, it's important to understand the trajectory of where we've been, to understand where we are now. And that's true of, you know, all mm. cultural output. But also I think for people that aren't necessarily like even huge cinephiles or hugely into Hollywood history, I think they're actually, those are the people that would be most pleasantly surprised and maybe even shocked by some of these films because there is still very much an idea that Hollywood was a very sanitized, family-friendly place um, that, oh, in the old days, they yeah, okay, they smoked a lot, but they didn't swear and they didn't no. take drugs and they didn't, you know, and all, you know, this whole thing. And I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard my own mom say that stuff. <laughs> so like, it's that sort of thing of like, actually, it's quite, I think it's quite important to understand that the past was not some kind of bastion of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, and for better or for worse, for, for pre-codes, excesses, um, and it's kind of sometimes waving away of workplace sexual harassment or mm -hmm. its use of blackface or yellow face or these things which are reprehensible, mm. but also for, and you know, for the ways in which it stands out against, I guess, our mainstream concept of what Hollywood is and was. It's, mm. it's important for people to understand that the past is a little bit, it's, it's not a straight line towards being progressive. It's often peaks and trails. Yeah. And I think it's just important in general. I think, you know, Philip Larkin was joking when he said that thing about 1963, it's not true. All our grandparents did, you know, go to bed uh, with each other and they didn't keep one foot on the floor at each time. Uh, I think it's really important when we've got a sort of, it feels like there's a kind of rising tide of um, moral conservatism at the moment, that you can't stamp these things out. There wasn't like a past when everyone behaved as they should. There was a past where people broke the law and they gave in to their desires and they took illegal drugs and things like that. And it's not, um, it's not something that you can just wave away by changing the films that we watch or changing a few laws. You know, people will still live their lives. And I think it's quite instructive to remember that the people on the screen are just like flesh and blood people telling the stories of people just like them. So, you know, obviously not everyone uh, has their lowest moment in life in a tangerine velvet negligee de designed by Adrian. But um, I do think that something was quite soothing and seeing your own problems and worries painted back to you by Hollywood in a slightly more glamorous light. Uh, you know, if I, if I had Norma Shearer worries, I think I'd be okay. <laughs> There's no bigger self than that, I think. No, um, if you can live your life emotionally, at least, as if you were Norma Shearer, you're doing okay. Um, yeah, about, I think about to, like, yeah. enforce the code of leaving the cinema. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>